and uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Jesse and Paul um, for Display Skin, exploring poseware displays on a flexible photophoretic wristband. So I'll hand over to you. Oh, if you'd like to welcome, welcome first. <laughs> Hi, so I'm Jesse, this is Paul, and with our supervisor, Professor Roel Vertigal, we're going to be talking about display skin. Um, display skin is a wrist-worn device with a flexible display that wraps around the wrist, and it has what we call a pose-aware display. Uh, it's our term, so let me show you one scenario in action to see how it works. Here you're going to see uh, Paul using display skin in a car. And since the display wraps around his wrist, there's always pixels in view. And this allows us to show content in an area where it's not occluded. And at the same time, as he moves his arm around, display skin maintains the north orientation of the map. And that's just one example of a pose-aware display. However, display skin's story starts way back in the beginning of the 19th century with the introduction of this, the bracelet watch. And these are considered jewelry it was something only the rich wore. They're meant for fashion, not for their function. What most people actually carried was a pocket watch. It's something we might see as the equivalent of mobile technology. And it transitioned into the, the, the end of the 19th century, where soldiers started using timepieces to coordinate attacks during battles. What they needed to do was balance riding a horse, wielding a weapon, and on top of that, they needed to check the time. And they realized that, hey, strapping a watch to the wrist could actually serve a useful function. It conveniently displayed information, the time, uh, to supplement their primary activity. Uh, and after that, the use of wristwatches quickly spread to the civilian population. And in essence, um, this mobile technology was transitioned into a wearable technology. And we also find this interesting to see it mirrored today as companies move the functions of mobile phones to wearable devices. On the left here, you can see a wristlet. It's one of the first wristwatches that soldiers commissioned from their saddle makers, which basically just took a pocket watch and strapped it to the wrist. And beside it is the Apple Watch, and that's coming out later this year. And when you look at the form factors, not much has really changed in the past 200 years from the introduction of the bracelet watch. What we've done is shrunk a full computer down to the size of a watch and put it onto our wrist. And this is supposedly because it's easier to access. But the thing is, like, why would we actually want to do this? Is ease of access actually a compelling argument? And if we look at, if we look around here, a major amount of work is actually invested in trying to figure out how to interact with these small devices. Um, so the, the goal of a lot of research is in overcoming the constraints in both display area and input area of wrist-worn devices. And this is sort of puzzling because display size and interaction size, interaction area, those aren't actually intrinsic constraints of wrist-worn devices. It's a, it's a limit that we impose on ourselves based on the, on the tradition of the wristwatch. Um, another thought that we had is that shrinking a computer to the size of a watch, um, putting it on the wrist, it tricks us into thinking of a wrist-worn device as if it were a computer. And I, I just saw Cheng smiling, and she sort of alluded to this in her talk on shimmering wristwatches. Uh, Cheng was talking about that um, there's information which is glanceable, and then there's sort of rich information which requires focus. And I think that's like an important distinction to make how when we interact with, when I interact with this computer, for example, it's assumed to be the continuous focus of my attention, whereas a wrist-worn device, I glance at it for a moment, but it's not the continuous focus of my attention. And Taking these considerations into account and the short history that Jesse outlined earlier, we sort of came up with some design criteria for our own wrist-worn device. Um, and the first one is that, well, we observed that wrist-worn devices became popular because they were used to supplement a primary activity with contextual information. 
Um, our second sort of design criteria was let's not restrain ourselves to the small size. Like there's no intrinsic reason for a wrist-worn device to have a tiny display. Um, and then our final criteria that I outlined is that we wanted to design something for glanceable, fast interactions rather than for continuous attention. Now, if we look at work published here in the last couple of years, there's a lot of work that Jesse and I really like, which explore how technology and body complement each other and interact with each other, creating systems together. Um, and for us, like, we thought that one of the most cap like, a basic capability of the body is that I know how my limbs are arranged. I know where I'm standing relative to this table. Um, and actually, in the opening keynote, I found this very interesting. Frank Wilson, um, he alluded to the importance of proprioception when he was talking about why certain prostheses were used and others were not. Um, and what we thought is, well, what, what could, we, could we design a device which sort of complements the sense of proprioception? Um, and we realized that such a device, if it knows its orientation relative to our body, it can display information in a place where it's actually visible to us. And we felt that this might be an elegant solution for a wrist-worn device. Um, Jesse? So how did we actually go about making a device that both understands the body's position and then displaying information where it's visible? Display skin has three primary components. And the first is a flexible display that's wrapped around the wrist. And as I've mentioned, this allows us to have pixels always in view. And on the input side, display skin has infrared touch sensors and also a series of IMUs that allow us to create a kinematic model of the user's arm. And using this new technology of flexible displays allowed us to create this previously unexplored form factor. Um, but as a new technology, we just uh, discovered that they require special considerations. They do have some limits. Had we simply forced the display to stay into a high degree of curvature, the materials would be under constant stress. And instead, we decided to modify the display such that its resting state would be naturally cylindrical. So what we did was we took a large plastic logic e-ink display and we cut it to size and we inserted it into a 3D printed frame for structural support very carefully. And then not so carefully, since the display is plastic, we thermoformed both the frame and the display together into a cylindrical shape. And the end result is a device in which its resting state is shaped like a cylinder to go around the wrist. So um, we had a lot of work on the mechanical side of things, but also on the electronic, the sensing side. Uh, there were two major sensing challenges. The first was how to actually get reliable touch sensing working on a curved e-ink display. Um, we ended up building our own solution because there was no commercial sensor which is able to do this. Uh, what we did is we have, at the bottom of the device, there is an array of IR diodes and IR phototransistors. And if a finger touches the display, it reflects infrared light back into the transistors, which, using a blob tracking algorithm, we can detect where is the finger touching the device. and based on blob size, how far away from the sensors is it. So we get an X and Y position on this curved area out of our sensor. The larger focus of our system, however, was on the kinematic tracking. So we, we modeled the arm as a kinematic chain with two links. Um, we have an IMU embedded in display skin itself and a second IMU which is worn on the upper arm. And using basic trigonometry, we calculate the position of the elbow, and based on that, the position orientation of the wrist. The position of the head, we just, we assumed, we started with an assumed position relative to the shoulder. And we were worried that we would have to tweak this a lot, but we found that a rough approximation was completely fine for creating the effect that we were interested in. 
Um, and once we had that set up, uh, the first thing we did is we wrote some software that allowed us to display all information in such a way that it would always be in view of the user. And in the second step, we um, not only displayed it at a place which is in view, but we also corrected the orientation so that it would be oriented towards the user's face inde independently of body pose. Um, and this is, this is where the kinematic tracking really shines because some of you might have considered that the, um, a lot of this can be done with IMUs, but a lot of it, this for example, actually requires a kinematic model to work. And if you take these two, these two modalities or a system together, um, yeah, it creates pretty cool effects. Uh, an example we like to show is this map example because there's lots of motion and there's really a lot to see. Um, and yeah, we, we like it. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but there's a lot of very subtle interactions which become possible with the system. Um, interactions which are not as easy to demonstrate because they're barely noticeable, but they're still there and they really make a difference. So you actually wanted to investigate these differences and see if whether a, a pose-aware display could provide measurable benefits for glance-based interactions over a standard watch face placement. What we did is design an experiment in which participants were engaged with a simple fit style pointing task where the wrist angle was mapped to their cursor position. And after random trials of this task, they'd be interrupted by a message stating that they needed to attend to a notification on display scan, which was sort of a stand-in for an audio or vibration cue. And when the not uh, interruption occurred, an arrow would appear on display scan on the wrist, and they had to acknowledge it by swiping it in the direction that the arrow indicated. And then after that, participants had to immediately return back to the pointing task by bringing their hand back to the same angle. Uh, these are the different angles that we uh, interrupted, them at, interrupted them at. And by asking the participants to perform a task with this wrist rotation, it allowed us to control the level of occlusion at the top of the wrist at the moment when a notification occurred. And these are the four. Uh, and for the different conditions, the notifications either appeared on the top of the wrist, like a witch, uh, watch face, or in our pose-aware condition, it was always directly in view. And we had two primary measures, and the first was homing time. And this is how long it took the participant uh, to reach the not notification with their other hand and touch it. And the second was resume time, which was after the swipe, how long it took them to bring the wrist back to the uh, angle that they were notified at and resume their primary task. And so what did we find? Well, overall, there was a statistically significant result that the pose-aware uh, display is faster for this overall interruption, swiping, and returning back to the task. Um, let's break it down, though. Um, there's uh, am I on the right side? Yeah. So, for homing times, the pose aware display uh, did have statistically significant uh, faster homing times. And this is because, since the pose aware display is always oriented in the no notification towards the face, there's no need to reposition the wrist to reach the angle, regardless of the angle of the wrist. What's interesting is that the pose aware display had increasingly improved homing times, the more occluded the watch face would be. And it's not really a surprising result, but it's the one we're interested to have. Essentially, the more occluded the watch face is, the longer it takes to access it. On the other hand, for resume times, we didn't find uh, a difference in uh, those times, although that we did find there was a trend in the pose aware uh, display having slightly faster times. And this is because for the zero and 30 degree angles where not much is occluded, participants, even though they didn't need to reposition their wrist to swipe the arrow, they still did because it made the action a little bit easier. So we're seeing a bit of a trade-off between efficiency and the comfort. 
Essentially, there are certain angles that are more comfortable to swipe with the other hand than others. But if you're interested to see like the full results, uh, read the paper. Uh, to summarize, though, our experiment showed that a poseware display does make accessing supplemental information easier. And one last note about the experiment: uh, if you remember the angles that we tested, these were explicit choices for the um, edge cases of partial occlu occlusion. In every case, some amount of the top of the wrist was visible. Uh, in everyday movements for activities, uh, a watch face would probably be more occluded, even completely occluded, and we expect the benefits of display skin to be even greater. So we were testing display skin in various scenarios. Um, and I had one really interesting experience that I'd sort of like to share. Um, I was playing the guitar and we were using it to see, like, can we display chords so that I can play the chords? And usually I'm viewing all of this out of like sort of the designer of the technology perspective. And while I was doing that, I all of a sudden like transitioned to like the excited user who just sort of wants, wants to actually use this and like wants to take this home. And it was really interesting and, ex and enjoyable experience. Um, and I think this highlights one of the strengths of the um, technology that we're creating here. Um, because, well, because we have this model, um, a way that I see this being used in the future um, is that we use this model for activity tracking and detecting activities in a much higher resolution than current activity trackers can do. Um, and this will allow us to show context-specific information um, automatically. And, and we think this idea is actually really important to wrist-worn devices. Um, looking back at how Jesse initially introduced it with why people initially started wearing wristwatches, um, their function was always to support a primary activity. So nobody adopted a wristwatch because he or she was a pass passionate time checker they would adopt the wristwatch because checking the time would help them do some other task better. Um, and this also relates back to some of the comments we had on trends in recent smartwatches um, that just because we can miniaturize something and put it on the wrist does not mean we should adopt it one to one. Like there's no need for the size to be what they currently are. And again, my wrist is not the focus of my attention. It's something in my, prox in my proximity which I interact with intermittently. So these are, again, the design principles that we specifically attempt to cater to, to these fast glance-based glance interactions by using a display which wraps around the, entire uh, around the entire arm. So there's pixels visible no matter what my arm configuration is. And then, in order to optimally use this available space, we created the kinematic model in order to display things where I can actually see them. And that, in a nutshell, is display skin. Thank you. Okay, so I've um, got quite a bit of time for questions, so if anyone would like to take the mic. Um, that's okay. So, I have okay. in front of the University of Michigan. And uh, I think this is a very cool technique, and I could, uh, what I say is not just uh, as um, you enlarge the display region, but also seeing it as an extension of, of the interaction region, potentially. So um, what I could think is that I would uh, usually turn over my wrist very often, and uh, I could think of, uh, such as a drawing application, that I would have the drawing on one side of my wrist, and uh, have all the tools on the other side so I could uh, just turn over and support very effective mode switch. So, and um, I just want to know if you have in mind about the, um, some of the natural gestures that you may work on the future that are transformed from the, uh, the daily lives. Okay, so um, the techniques that we're presenting here, uh, we don't think that these are the only techniques you use with this type of device. 
And we did not go into it in that much detail because it did not become a focus of this paper, but we spent quite a lot of time on our touch technology in order to enable the type of interactions that you were just describing. Um, so yes, I want to be able to do these interactions if I choose to. Um, and our sensor has affordances to accommodate that. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, okay, thank you. Hi, John Tong from Microsoft Research. I love the display affordances of the device. I was wondering if you could comment on the constraints or the future opportunities for the interaction. So, for example, it looks like you can't detect multi-touch within a row, or do you think that that's possibly something you could overcome? And what's the resolution of the interaction you think you can get on touching it? Okay, so, so um, we cannot detect it's not truly multi-touch in both dimensions. Right, it's right. multi-touch in one dimension, but not the other. Right. Um, the resolution we get, um, we did not do any formal measurements of it, but I, I would assume within, th within 1.5 millimeters, I can pinpoint where uh -huh. your finger is. Um, but that really was not our focus. Our focus was on sort of, because again, we're in this glance-based paradigm, our focus was on enabling very fast interactions, and those would usually be gestures, swipes, and not very high-resolution type interactions. Um, I think it may be possible with this type of technology, but it was not our focus. Meg Withcut from Panafold. Maybe a flip side of John's question. Um, well, I, I love seeing the guitar scenario. It, it was so great. Uh, and I want the API, but I, I wondering, are you going to talk with um, teachers and teenage girls and five-year-olds and see what they want? Any plans? Uh, we haven't really planned on that right now, um, but we do think that there is a, like a really wide opportunity for uh, these context-aware applications, and that's, that's sort of the idea. No matter what context you're in, it would have there's always some information that's going to help you. And whether that's during play or during work or exercise, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Yeah. Uh, to, to add on to this, um, I, I do think if we were to deploy this in the wild, it's very important to do what you're suggesting. And um, also, like going back to the panel where there was a lot of talk, why are we designing one thing for a teenager and for an person older than 90, like, um, I think this type of technology also lends itself for very personalized and specific designs, which can cater to the type of groups you were just suggesting. Thank you. Uh, Floyd Mueller, RMIT. Um, just a quick clarification question that might actually sound silly, but I just wanted to check. So this was your hand in the video, right? I see where this is going, yes. <laughs> You do? Because I was wondering, so you're saying you have two inertial sensors attached to the arm, but no camera, because I saw the marker on your hand. But then I thought, it's just a tattoo, right? So I wondered whether you did the tattoo to track your arm, which I thought was pretty cool. Or is it just a tattoo? <laughs> Sorry, it's just a silly. <laughs> I am dedicated to my work. <laughs> but there were no vision-based systems involved. So you had that beforehand? Correct. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Hey, uh, so this is really great. Um, I sort of want to make one myself. How much can you cut down the uh, English display without breaking it? Can you make it fingernail size? So essentially, with the displays we are using, they have uh, connectors on the left and the top side. So as long as uh, you don't disconnect all of them, you set, essentially have the top left corner still intact. It's still mostly works. And you just ad address those pixels. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Um, so you could make a finger, finger size uh, display, but you might still have some long connectors at the end. But you're assuming that we start from a big display. There are small <laughs> displays as well. Like if you, want yeah, a sure. if you want a fingernail sized one, I would not recommend you start out with our display, but they are available. Okay. <laughs> and also, um, when you are tracking the hand, the the fingers with the infrared sensor. Do you notice any um, noise from your left hand on the hand where you are actually wearing it? Like, can you possibly track the finger on the same hand already? 
I do not understand your question. Could you Sorry. rephrase it? <laughs> so basically, you have the device on the left hand on the wrist. Um, given how the infrared sensor is oriented, can you detect the left hand fingers movement oh. with those? Uh, no. Um, so so you're, you're, uh, you're asking, can our sensor, like, does it have the range that I could do gestures here? Yeah. Uh, this sensor does not. Um, but I, I, I see where you're going with that idea, and it is a feasible idea. And then finally, just as a note, um, we are working on this thing to make elastic track and more efficient, but then it could also be a place where when you're bored, you look at it and play some video game. So I was looking at that and thought it would be fun to have a space in there where your bullet goes around the display and hits yourself and such. Like, being around is actually a lot of fun, so go explore those. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, well, that was the, the last paper of the talk, uh, so it's just come to the end. So next, next session starts at 11. Uh, just a quick note to if all the, the next presenters can come up during the break. And so, yeah, I'd just like to yeah, thank Jesse, Paul, and all the rest of the presenters. Thank you.